You guys ready to study the word? 2 Samuel chapter 2 is where we find ourselves today. You know, we've been studying verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the Bible. We've just finished 1 Samuel and we've entered into 2 Samuel. And my goal this morning is to study all of chapter 2 and then, and then just barely make our way into chapter 3. But I want to give you a warning before we start this chapter. Um, the warning is this. There's a lot of names and places in this chapter. I'm going I'm to do my very best to explain who's who and, and, and what's what, but I'm also going to do my very best to pronounce everything right. Um, uh, you know, if, if I get something wrong, just know that uh, I don't need to be corrected. That's the way I say it, and, and you can say it a different way. Um, you know, but I, I'm, look, we're just going to study it. We're going to make our way through it the best we can. Father, this is your word. And we want to say, Lord, that we love your word. We came this morning with an expectant heart that your word is going to correct us where we need corrected. It's going to warn us where we need a warning. It's going to encourage us and exhort us and inspire us, Lord. Just pray that you would do a wonderful work through the power of your spirit and do it through the teaching of your word. We pray now, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin this morning by speaking to you about the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands are situated in the South Atlantic Ocean. They sit just off the coast of Argentina. Now, this is what you need to know about the Falkland Islands. They've been... Uh, British territory and under British control since 1841. Now listen to this. On April 2nd, 1982, the uh, Argentina military invaded and occupied the Falkland Islands. The reason is stated that the Falkland Islands are actually their territory and not British territory, and they were just claiming it for themselves. Well, you can imagine the British government was none too pleased to hear the news. They woke up one morning and said, man, well, the Argentine military has invaded our land. What are we going to do about it? And so three days later, uh, the British government dispatched a naval task force to engage the Argentine Navy and Air Force. The conflict became known as the Falkland Island War. And um, it lasted 74 days, and it ended with the Argentine surrender which, of course, um, returned the islands back to British control. In total, 649 Argentine military personnel were killed in the conflict. 255 British military personnel were killed in the conflict. And three Falkland Islers died in the conflict. Well, listen to this. After the war, an, uh, uh, um, a, a very well-known Argentine writer was asked, about his thoughts concerning the conflict between the British and the Argentine militaries. And, and his name is George Lewis. The interviewer said to George Lewis, what are your thoughts about, your, about the Falkland Island War? And he said one statement that quickly became a laughing matter around the world. This is what he said. The Falkland Island War, man, that's like two bald men fighting over a hairbrush. My friends, his statement implies something that can be drawn as a conclusion for our pastors today. His statement implies that war was not the right decision, at least in this matter that we're going to read today. And his statement implies that conflict was absolutely unnecessary and certainly preventable. Well, what you're going to see today in this chapter contains an event where the same conclusion can be drawn. You're going to see today that the pride and the selfish ambition of one man leads to a conflict that was unnecessary and uh, certainly um, uh, preventable. Well, it's an exciting passage. It's a thrilling passage. I'm excited to teach it and read through it, and I hope you're excited as well. Uh, let's just come to verse 1. We're going to begin to see all of this unfold. We're told in verse 1, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. Well, David said, well, where should I go? And he said, to Hebron. Now, it's important to remember the events leading up to this chapter. 
You remember the Philistines. The Philistines are the country, the neighboring country that sit to the west of Israel. And the Philistines are also Israel's greatest enemy. The Philistines have just launched a massive military attack against northern Israel. And the result, let's just say, was devastating. We learned from the previous chapters that in just one battle, Israel's army suffered a tremendous loss and defeat. The Philistines invade and occupy most of northern Israel. And the royal family, the first king of Israel, King Saul and his sons, have been killed in the battle. I think we would all agree this is a national disaster for the nation of Israel. Now, it's also important to remember, way back in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel came on the scene and he anointed David to be the next king of Israel, to be King Saul's successor. David knew and understood this. So now with King Saul's death, David seeks divine guidance on what to do. And verse 1 tells us that after consulting with the Lord, David was directed to go up to Hebron. Now, just in case you're interested, Hebron sits southwest of Jerusalem. It's in southern Israel, and it's 27 miles from where David is currently located at in a place called Ziklag. Now, look at what happens next, verses 2 and 3. So David went up there, and his two wives also, his two wives are listed there in verse 2. Verse 3, and David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household, so they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Now, when we read verse 2 and 3, most of us are immediately struck by the fact that David has two wives. We didn't hear anything else in those two verses except for the fact that David has two wives, right? Well, listen, I, I, I want to, you know, address this, but we're going to do so at a later time. We're going to address this matter when David has a few more wives. What I really want you to see here, what I really want to point out is that David has inquired of the Lord on what to do now that King Saul is dead, and the Lord has instructed him to go to Hebron. Now, David, he's obedient to the Lord. He takes his wives. He takes his family. He takes his army of men and all their household, and they make the 27-mile trip from Ziklag to Hebron. Now, once they're settled in Hebron, Look at what happens now in verse 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. So here it is in a single verse. Guys, we've been studying the book of Samuel for quite some time. We've known for a long time that David is the next king of Israel. He's been chosen. He's been anointed, right? But here it is. In a single verse, we have the beginning of David's accession to the throne of Israel. David had already been chosen and anointed by God it's to be the uh, next king of Israel. But now we see men come alongside of this divine anointing, and they administer another anointing as a way of saying, uh, we accept God's chosen king for us. Now, be sure you notice something in verse 4. If you miss out on what I'm about to say, you're probably going to miss out on the rest of the passage this morning. This is very important to understand. Verse 4 tells us that David was anointed king over the house of Judah. Judah is what we call southern Israel. So make sure you understand. At this point, David has been anointed king over southern Israel only. His dominion, his kingship does not reach into northern Israel at all. Now, as southern Israel's new king... The great task before David was to gently extend his kingship and to secure peaceful allegiance over the entire nation of Israel to reach into the northern kingdom. And his, <clears throat> and his first efforts to do this was targeted to a, a people group, um, Israelites, of a small town called Jabesh Gilead. Look at the latter half of verse 4 through verse 7 with me. You'll see what happens. And then... And, and they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh-Gilead were, uh, were the ones who buried Saul. And so David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said to them, 
You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you this kindness because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Well, listen, I just want to remind you of something. You remember after this great battle in which King Saul and his sons died, the Philistines came out to the battlefield the following day, and they just stripped the dead of anything that was valuable. Well, while they're doing this, the Philistines were searching over all the bodies and all this, and while they're doing it, um, um, they come across King Saul, and they come across his sons. They're dead out on the battlefield. And the first thing they do, they cut off Saul's head, and they sent messengers throughout the land with the message saying, Saul, the king of Israel, has been killed by the Philistines. The second thing they do is they take Saul's armor back to their temple, and they set it before their idols, their false gods. This was a way for the Philistines to tell the, 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 the entire world who knew about the battle, this, this, this was a way for them to say, the Philistine gods are mightier and greater than the God of Israel. And then the third thing that they did, and I would consider this worst of all, they take Saul's decapitated body and the bodies of his sons, they take them to a city called Beth Shane, and they hung them on the city walls. And so... The people of Jabez Gilead, we know, were extremely loyal to King Saul. And when they heard what the Philistines had done with the bodies of King Saul and his sons, man, they got up, they marched all through the night. They came to Jabez Gilead, they took the bodies down from the wall, or they came to Beth Shane, they took the bodies off the wall, they brought them back to Jabez Gilead, and they gave them a proper burial. Now make sure you understand. What these men did to recover the bodies of King Saul and, 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 and his sons, it was a courageous act, but yet it was a dangerous endeavor. And so here's David in an attempt to extend his kingship into northern Israel. He sends messengers to the people of Jabesh Gilead complimenting them on the respect they had shown for the remains of King Saul and his sons. David knows something here. David knows if I can gain the support of Saul's most loyal people, then it's going to be a whole lot easier for me to gain the, the support of the entire nation. Now, before we're given a response by the people of Jabesh Gilead on whether they're going to accept David as their king or not, the author of this passage shifts scenes. And he shifts scenes to a situation where Saul's surviving relatives are really just staking their claim to the throne of Israel. Let me just say this. Things are about to get really intense in Israel at this moment. Look at it here in verses 8 through 11. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahinahim, and he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin and over all Israel, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now, it's important in verse 8 to remember this guy called Abner. Let me tell you why. He is going to be a key figure in the next couple of chapters. You don't want to forget about this guy. Abner, we're told in verse 8, is the commander of Saul's army. And we know from other passages that Abner is Saul's cousin. So that makes him a surviving relative of King Saul. So here he is, still extremely loyal to the dead King Saul. He rejects David's kingship by taking Saul's only remaining son. His name is Ishbosheth. And he sets him up as king, not over northern Israel, as king over all of Israel. Now, Scripture doesn't have much to say about Saul's surviving son, his last son, Ishbosheth. But one thing is clear. He was a weak, 
puppet ruler manipulated by Abner. And you're going to see this in chapter 3 and chapter 4 when we get to it. Everyone knew that Ishbosheth had been set up as king, but everyone also knew that he didn't hold any power. Um, the real power is held by Abner, who's filled with pride and selfish ambition. So make sure you understand, when Abner rejects David's kingship and sets up Saul's last remaining son as king, he was deliberately rebelling against God. And he was deliberately rebelling against God's plan for Israel. My friends, God chose David and God anointed David to be the next king of Israel. Now, even though this is so, notice that we never see David assert his right to the throne. Rather, he just simply chose to leave the matter in the hands of the Lord. And, and listen, if God had chosen and anointed him to be the next king of Israel, then God would be the one to subdue his enemies, and God would set up him as king over all of Israel without David having to push his way to the throne. My friends, it would be years to come, a lot of years to come, uh, but the day would eventually come when David would be the king over all of Israel. Isn't the same true with our Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus is patiently waiting for the Father's time and to rule the entire world. And, and listen, right now, the kingdom of God is only recognized by a minority of people around the world. And, 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 but I can promise you this. I've read Scripture enough, and my theology is good. I know what the Bible says to be true. I can promise you this. The Bible is very true that there will be a day and there will be a time. As a matter of fact, you could say it this way. There will be an appointed day, an appointed time where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So here's Abner in an attempt to reject David as king. He sets up Saul's only surviving son, Isposheth as king. <laughs> look, at what, look at what he does in verse 12. Now Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Isposheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahinahim to Gibeon. Now listen, what we see here is an aggressive military force from Abner. When we read there in verse 12 that Abner and the servants of Ishbosheth went out uh, from Mahinahim to Gibeon, it's understood that Abner has taken a group of men, left northern Israel, and has now penetrated southern Israel, the territory that David is king over. Look at what happens next, verse 13. And Joab, stop right there. I told you to remember Abner, because he's going to be a key figure in the next couple of chapters. Abner is King Saul's cousin, commander of King Saul's army. Joab, I want to encourage you, familiar, familiarize yourself with Joab, because he's going to be another key figure over the next couple of chapters. Joab is David's nephew, and Joab is the commander of, of David's army. And so, verse 13 says, And Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. So they sat down, one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So listen, Joab, the commander of David's army, Joab learns of Abner's military campaign into Judah, or you would say southern Israel, and he responds immediately. He takes a group of men to encounter Abner, and, and his men, and they meet them by the pool of Gibeon. And you guys know I like pictures, I like giving visuals. Just as a side note, we're going to put a picture up on the screen of the pool of Gibeon. Um, this pool was discovered by an archaeological expedition in 1956. The pool was 37 feet in diameter. It's 35 feet deep. And as you can see in the picture, it has a five-foot wide staircase that winds downward around the inside wall. This is where the two groups meet. We're told in verse 13, after they meet by the pool of Gibeon, they all sit down. So, so when you look at the picture, picture Abner and his men on one side of the pool, they're sitting down, and picture Joab and his men sitting on the other side of the pool. Now, just so we're all on the same page, in case you've missed and under, misunderstood what I've been saying this morning. We're rooting for Joab and his men. 
But we're on the southern kingdom side, right? I mean, just, just so we all are on, on, on the same page. If anybody's rooting for the northern kingdom, I, I don't know what to tell you. Now, Abner's going to speak first. They're all sitting around the pool. Abner's going to speak first. Look at it here in verses 14 through 16. Then Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Now, let me just real quick, I mean, just side note. I, I love this guy, Joab. I don't like everything about him, but I like him. I mean, I like what he does here. You know, Ab Abner just says to Joab, he says, hey, you know what? You guys want to fight? And Joab's like, yeah, let's fight, you know? And so in a verse 15, so they arose and went over by number, 12 from Benjamin followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 from the servants of David. And each one grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called the field of sharp swords, which is in Gibeon. Now get this. As they're sitting around the pool, Abner suggests to Joab. He says, hey, guy, hey, look, you know, Joab, I, I got this idea. Let's have this small-scale conflict between 12 men from each of our military groups. And, you know, just so we can avoid an all-out war. We, 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 you don't want it. I don't want it. Let's just have 12 men from each side fight. And, you know, we'll just deal with the outcome, wh wh whichever way it goes. We would call this representative warfare. Joab quickly agrees. He's like, yeah, he just, he just wants to fight. So Joab agrees. The 12 men from northern Israel, the 12 men... From southern Israel, face one another, and when the conflict begins, each man grabs his opponent by the head, and each man thrust his sword into their side, and each man died. So, I mean, make sure you understand, the result, all 24 men fell down together and died. Without getting into a long explanation of this, because we got, still got a lot of ground to cover, I'll just say this. This was a quick battle with a bizarre ending. Now, since the result was inconclusive, the very thing they were trying to avoid now takes place. A fierce battle breaks out between the rest of the men. Look at it here, verses 17 through 23. So there was a fierce battle that day, and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Now, the three sons of Zariah, let's stop right there for a minute. Zariah, anybody know who Zariah is? Zariah is David's sister. David's sister. So the three men that's going to be listed next are Zariah's sons, which will be nephews to David. We're told there's Joab. We know who Joab is, right? He's the commander of David's army. Then we're told there's Abishai. You guys know who Abishai is? Let me remind you because I love this guy. You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 26? David had this crazy idea. He's like, hey, uh, you know, we snuck over the top of the mountain. We could see the Saul and his guys. They're camped out. They're in a circle, right? And Saul is right in the middle of the camp. And so David says, man, I want to go down there. You want to do what? Yeah, I want to go down there. And David said, anybody want to go with me? Nobody wants to go. And then one guy raises his hand. He says, I'll go. I'm crazy enough to do it. I'll go. Who was that guy? That was Abishai. They snuck down there, they took the jug of water, they took the spear. As they're standing over Saul as he's sleeping, Abishai's like, hey, let me take the spear and stick this guy to the ground. It would only take me one time to do it. And David's like, no, 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 we don't want to do that right now. And so then they sneak their way back through the camp and then into the darkness in the wilderness. That was Abishai, a nephew of David, second son to Zariah. And then we have this guy Asahel. And we're told in verse 18, and Asahel was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. Um, so Asahel pursued Abner, and in going, he did not turn to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him, and he said, are you Asahel? He answered, I am. And Abner said to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left and lay hold on one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. But Asahel would not turn aside from, from, uh, from following him. So Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother Joab? However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear. So the spear came out of his back and he fell down there and died on the spot. 
So it was that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died, stood still. So you understand, this fierce battle takes place between the army of David led by Joab and the, and the supporters of Saul led by Abner. And before long, Joab and the men of David were able to gain the upper ground in the battle, forcing Abner and his men to retreat. Now as Abner and his men are running, this guy Asahel, man, he's David's nephew, he, he, he decides, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to pursue Abner, and I'm going to pursue him with the intent of killing him. Um, Asahel was described this way, as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. You guys don't need me to stand up here and tell you what that means. A everyone who hears that knows that this is a reference to the fact that he's a fast runner, right? And so there's Asahel. He's pursuing Abner, probably quickly gaining ground on him. Abner yells out to him. He tries to persuade him to stop his pursuit. You have to remember something here. Abner is an older man. And not only is he an older man, he's got a lot of warfare experience. And we're also told that he has a spear in his hand. Now, I'd like to think that Asahel showed up with some kind of a weapon. That's why they were sent out to defend southern Israel. But we're not told he has a weapon. All we're told is that he's a fast runner. And what we do know that Abner has a spear in his hand. And it really seems as, as if Abner doesn't want to kill Asahel. He tells him twice, and as I was pursuing, he tells him twice, hey, man, stop chasing me. Turn around. Go kill the young guy, man. Take his stuff. Take his armor. Don't chase me. I don't want to kill you. And so when it became apparent that Asahel would not listen to Abner's plea to stop his pursuit, Abner suddenly stopped. He planted his feet. He pulled up his spear, and Asahel was running so fast that he hit the spear he hit the spear so hard. I mean, make sure you understand what the scripture is saying here. He hit the blunt end of the spear. Not, not, not the pointy end, not the sharp end, the blunt end. As I read, it's like, you know, you got a shovel and the one end square off on, on the handle. He hit the blunt end of the spear. He's running so fast that it penetrated his abdomen and it came out through his back. He died right there on the spot. I, look, I, you guys may know this. You may not know this. It takes an incredible amount of strength to take the blunt end of a board, the blunt end of a stick, whatever you want to call it, and push it through the admin, 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 whatever that is, the stomach, and then it comes out the back. It takes an incredible amount of strength. And so I want to park here just for a moment and share something with you. You know, there's been a lot of sermons, a lot of messages given on Asahel. And listen, there's a lot of truths, a lot of principles about this guy. Um, and, you know, and I was tempted to take one Sunday and really just speak about Asahel, all the truths and principles. And we'll see what the Lord wants to do with that. Maybe we'll just keep on going through Second Samuel. But this is what I want you to know concerning Asahel today. I have known people who have tremendous talents and tremendous abilities and they use them foolishly and they get themselves into all kinds of trouble. Um, whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is, whatever your ability is, you should be sure to use it wisely and for the glory of God. You know, I was thinking about it this week, and I had to ask myself a question. You know, as you're studying through this account of Asahel and his pursuit of Abner, you've you got to logically ask the question, why in the world is Asahel pursuing Abner? I mean, why is he doing it? He's a young guy. He doesn't have a lot of warfare experience, yet, he, yet he's going to chase the, 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 the commander of the northern Israel army who has an whole lot of warfare experience. He's killed thousands of men. Why are you going to pursue that guy? It's foolish. L -l Listen, David doesn't even want his men from southern Israel to kill anyone. That's not why he sent them out. He sent them out for self-defense. He sent them out to protect southern Israel. He didn't send them out to kill. What does David want? David wants to win Abner over. 
David wants to unite Israel under his kingship. He doesn't want a civil war. What else the hell doesn't get it? He just likes to run. And that's his gift. In complete pride, in complete selfish ambition, he uses his greatest gift foolishly by trying to chase down and kill Abner, and the end result was his death. I can't stress this enough. Always use your greatest gifts for the best purposes. Um, Asahel was a great runner, and what a waste of such a marvelous gift. There are all kinds of ways he could have used his gift. I'm sure if we asked everybody in this room to write down something that he could have used his gift and his ability for to glorify God, I'm sure we could create a whole list. One thing that I think of you know, every military needs runners. Every military needs messengers to get messages from one place to another. Man, Asahel could have been used mightily, mightily by the Lord and David's army to bring messages from a, a military base to another camp or back to David or whatever. He could have been used mightily to do that. But he uses his gifts foolishly, and his end result uh, was his death. You know, I want you to ask yourself today, what is your gift? And, and, and ask yourself, are you using it for its best purpose? Are you using it for good? Are you using it to glorify God? And go before the Lord. Go before the Lord and offer him your gift. Go before the Lord and say something like this, Lord, you know that I'm gifted at such and such. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. You know that I'm gifted in that. And Lord, I'm, I'm just asking you right now, Lord, I'm offering it to you, and I'm asking you, Lord, how can I use it to bring about good? How can I use it to serve? How can I use it, Lord, mainly to glorify your name? How can I do that, Lord? But I am going to ask you to do this. I've seen it so many times, and it's so sad. Don't waste your gift. Don't, don't use it foolishly. Don't allow your gift to bring you into all kinds of trouble and, and heartache. Use your gift wisely. Use it for good and use it to glorify the Lord. Well, back to our text, verses 24 through 32. Asa, um, what's his name? Asahel just was killed by Abner. Now look at what happens, beginning with verse 24. We're going to read down to verse 32. Joab and Abishai also pursued Abner. And the sun was going down when they came to the hill of Emma, which is before Gaia, by the road to the wilderness of Gibeon. Now the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner and became a unit and took their stand on top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that it will be uh, bitter in the end, in the latter end? How long will it be? Then until you tell the people to return from pursuing their brethren. And then Joab responds. He said, as God lives, unless you had spoken, surely then by morning all the people would have given up pursuing their brethren. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and did not pursue Israel anymore, nor did they fight anymore. And then Abner and his men went on that night through the plain, crossed over the Jordan, and went through, uh, and went through all Bithran, and they came to Mahanaim. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, they were missing of David's servants, 19 men, and Asahel. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin of Abner's men, 360 men who died. Then they took up Asahel and buried him in his father's tomb, which was in Bethlehem, and Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at daybreak. Well, Asahel's brothers, Joab and Abishai must have saw Abner kill their brother because immediately they took up pursuit of Abner, no doubt determined to avenge the blood of their brother. However, in their pursuit, Abner and his men gathered themselves together and they successfully positioned themselves on top of a hill. And, and they know, Abner knows they have a positional advantage, but he also knows and he also sees the hopelessness of his situation. And so he calls for a truce. Abner calls out to Joab. He says what he says, and we just read through it. And this is just a way of saying, hey, man, we give up. 
We, we give up. Let's call for a truce. And then Joab responds back. He says what he says. This was a way of saying, Abner, oh, man, you better be glad you gave up. Because let me tell you something. My men and I, let me tell you, we're ready to chase and fight you all through the night and into the morning. And you should know that, Abner. And so a truce was made. Joab blows a trumpet in verse 28. All the people stood still. They didn't fight anymore. And with that, each group marched through the night to the respective home bases. Joab and his men, um, they returned to David in southern Israel. Missing from them is 19 men killed in battle. And then Abner and his men returned to northern Israel. Missing from them is 360 men killed in battle. So you understand, the guys we were rooting for have won. The southern kingdom, Joab and David's men have won the battle. Now, the first verse of chapter 3 simply serves as a summary for chapter 2. Uh, we read, now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. This phrase, long war, it suggests a state of hostility between northern and southern Israel for quite some time. We'll learn in the, couple, the coming chapters that it's seven years uh, total. And what we also need to see here is this, because of the pride and because of the selfish ambition of Abner, civil war has broke out among an already war-torn Israel. I mean, seriously, this conflict accomplished nothing more than intensifying division and disunity between the people of northern and southern Israel. This conflict was simply like what we said from the very beginning, two bald men fighting over a hairbrush. It was useless. It was not needed at all. And then if you're interested, verses 2 through 5 in chapter 3 is a bracket list of sons born to David while he was king in Hebron, king in southern Israel. You can read through it on your own. I don't want to pronounce all those names, but I will make this one statement. When chapter 2 begins, we're told that David has two wives. Um, now at the beginning of chapter 3, when you read through this list, verses 2 through 5, you learn that David has six children with six wives. And like I said, We'll deal with that matter at another time when David has more wives. Now, let me say this as we begin to conclude. Um, you're going to want to come back for chapter 3. Because, I, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put it out there for you. This uh, conflict between Joab and Abner is far from over, let me tell you. It is far from over. It's going to get very intense in chapter 3. Um, so you're going to want to be back for that. Now, I wish I could say you want to be back next Sunday for chapter 3. We're not going to be in a, a, a Second Samuel next Sunday. I'm going to be here, but we have a special service plan. We have a guest speaker coming in. He's going to share with us some stuff that he's got going on and, and all. It's going to be a good service. But then the following Sunday, we'll be back in 2 Samuel chapter 3. So you're going to have to wait two weeks for chapter 3. But I'm telling you, it is intense and you don't want to miss it. Now, allow me just to briefly conclude our time together with a few thoughts concerning the things we've read today. Was there anything accomplished by this small-scale conflict initiated by Abner? Not at all. Do you think this conflict should have even taken place? Not, I don't think it should have, not at all. Does the Old Testament law even give permission or approval for civil war in Israel? Not at all. The, the Old Testament law gives permission for the Israelites to defend themselves against neighboring countries, but the Old Testament law does not give Israel permission to fight among themselves and to have civil war. Uh, did God command this conflict to take place? Not at all. Did David want the conflict among the Israelite people? Not at all. David wanted unity. He wanted to unite northern and southern Israel, not a civil war. Then we got to ask ourselves, if, if, if all this didn't, you know, we say not at all to all these questions, then how and why did this conflict happen? 
Well, let me tell you how it happened. Let me tell you why it happened. Because when truth is rejected and denied, evil will always take over. Let me, let me just say that again. When truth is rejected and denied, evil will always take over. Um, isn't it true that David has been chosen and anointed to be the next king of Israel? That's very true. And it was God's idea. It was God's doing. God is the one who chose him. God was the one who anointed him. That, that, that is a true statement. And isn't it also true that Abner comes on the scene, he rejects this truth, and because he rejects and denies the truth, evil takes over in his heart. I'm telling you, when truth is rejected and denied, evil will always take over. We see it all throughout the world. And you know what I find very interesting about this? It would be one thing if we could say Abner didn't know anything about David being the next king of Israel. It would be interesting to say that. It would be like, okay, well, Abner didn't know, right? So he didn't know, so he just, okay, he just made a decision. There's Saul's last son, so let's make him the next king. But I'm telling you, Abner did know. You can go back to 1 Samuel, and on two different accounts that I know of, there may be more, but on two accounts that I know of, Abner heard King Saul admit and say, David, you will be the next king of Israel. So Abner knew. And so if Abner knew that David was chosen and anointed to be the next king of Israel, why did he, why did he rebel? Why did he oppose? Why did he reject God's will? Well, it comes back to our simple principle. Simply because the truth didn't gain his attention, simply because he denied and he rejected the truth, and well, evil took hold of his heart. My friends, just like it was for David here in this passage, so it is with Jesus. There are people, there are nations, there are countries that just simply will not submit to the truth of the gospel message, and they just simply will not submit to the Lord's anointed, Jesus Christ. Uh, and because they reject the Lord's anointed, because they oppose and rebel against the truth of the gospel, because they initiate a needless and unnecessary war against those who have accepted the truth of Jesus and the gospel, evil takes over in their heart. And we see this all throughout the world. We even see it here in America. But God has something to say to these people. He has something to say to them in Psalm 46, verses 8 through 10. God says to these people who reject him, God says to these people who oppose the truth, God says to these people who make war against the righteous, he says, come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. Look at this. Be still. This is God speaking. Be still. Be still, Abner. Be still, North Korea. Be still, Iran. Be still, you terrorist organizations. Be still, you domestic terror, terror organizations. Be still, you enemies of Israel. Be still, you persecutors of Christianity and the church. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That's what God says to the people who reject the truth and allow evil to take over their hearts. My friends, I got to tell you, in the end, truth wins, God's will wins, and God's anointed wins. God always wins. And I hope and I pray that you were on the winning side. And if you're not, I want to speak to you this morning. The winning side is Jesus' side. You know, we're told in the simple message of the gospel that God loves us so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins. Jesus didn't die for his sins. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was God in human flesh. He didn't die for his sins. Jesus died for our sins, and he died upon the cross. And the Bible is very clear. The Bible says by just... Uh, admitting to your sins, repenting of your sins, and putting your faith 
and Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross, one can have salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. And you know, there's so much to gain. So much to gain for a person who gives their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We gain forgiveness of sins. We gain a hope for eternity. We gain assurance that there's life after death, that, that, that we're going to live in the presence of God and the presence of Jesus forever. There's so much for that person to gain. And so I ask you this morning, those of you who are listening online, those of you who are in the building here, I ask you this morning, if you've never given your life to Jesus, can we say it this way? If, you've, if you're not on the winning side, Jesus is the winning side. If you're not on the winning side, would you do that this morning? Would you give your life to Jesus and would you come into a real lasting relationship with him? We'll go into prayer and I'll give you an opportunity to do that. Father, we love you and we love your word, Lord. And we know, Lord, that your word has, has been spoken this morning. We know that the truth of your word, the truth of your gospel has been spoke. And we just ask now, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and give us an opportunity to respond to your word. 